Um, today, we're going to spend um, about the next hour and 15 minutes. Um, I'll frame the conversation, then, and then hopefully we'll have a sort of larger group discussion um, and get everyone engaged. And so it'll be a more sort of participatory and generative process um, to get everyone thinking about um, sort of some key questions for today. Um, and so the key questions um, that I have, and if there are other things that folks have in mind, um, please also um, think um, and bring that into this space. Um, so what are the unique conditions and challenges facing the US South? Um, why is fighting for socialism in the US South important? And what are the, what are the inter intersecting struggles being taken up currently? Um, and how are queer and trans people of color leading the fight back? Um, and so those are sort of our guiding questions. Um, and the format, what we're going to do is I'll offer some framing, um, talk about HB2, House Bill 2, or also known as Heat Bill 2 that was recently passed in my home state of North Carolina. Um, and um, then we'll move into a large group discussion. Um, and towards the end, I'll talk a little bit about um, the Workers' World Party um, Moorhead Lily campaign um, for president and vice president um, to fight for revolutionary socialism. Sound good? Any questions? Awesome. Um, so again, my name is Lone. Um, I live in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina. My family and I migrated from Vietnam um, in the mid-90s. Um, in North Carolina, I primarily organized with uh, queer and trans youth of color um, around queer and trans liberation, uh, school push out, so issues of education justice, the school to prison pipeline, things like that. Um, and I will be your sole and only panelist facilitator chairperson today. Um, thank you for having me. Um, so I wanted to offer just sort of a little bit of framing, right? Um, so when we're thinking um, about this conversation today, we're all on the same page um, in terms of some key pieces about why we need to have this conversation, right? Um, so first thing first, uh, when we think about the US South, uh, we have to think about it in a global context, right? The U.S. South is a part of the global South, right? Um, and, and what that means is that um, it, it's home to um, migrants and immigrants from Asia, from the Middle East, from Latin America. Um, it's a, a, a part of the country that has a sort of consistently um, migrating and also displaced um, community, particularly um, migrating and displaced black communities. Um, if we think about uh, the legacy and history um, of uh, the slave states, um, if we think about the legacy of slavery um, uh, in, in the U.S. South, uh, we think about sort of um, what happened um, after um, black communities uh, were sort of falsely emancipated, right? Um, a lot of folks were making their ways to New York City, Chicago, out west. Um, and then as those places are now being uh, rapidly gentrified um, and black families are being pushed out of their homes, um, out of historically black neighborhoods, a lot of black folks are migrating back to the south um, where a lot of um, sort of their grandparents and great-grandparents were. Um, when we think about the U.S. South, we think about it within the context of the United States having these internal colonies, right? Um, and thinking about um, people of color, um, of black and brown folks, of indigenous folks as a part of these um, internal colonies because, again, the legacy of slavery um, and also genocide um, of native and indigenous folks uh, in the South. Um, and then we also think about, um, you know, how the United States has the world's largest military bases. Um, so there's like five of them. Um, and four are in the south. Uh, so we have Fort Bragg uh, in North Carolina. We have uh, Fort Campbell in Kentucky. We have Fort Hood in Austin, Texas. And then we have Fort Benning, which is sort of overlaps between Georgia and Alabama, right? Um, and so that speaks volumes in terms of what we mean when we talk about um, the United States and the US South as being the belly of the beast um, in, in terms of um, imperialism and building empire um, and building the military. Um, and then there's also, in the South, we have the largest growing queer and trans people of color population. 
Um, there are a lot of um, black and brown folks um, who live in the U.S. South um, who identify as lesbian or gay or bisexual or same gender loving um, or men who have sex with men. Uh, like that's a very large population. Um, and simultaneously, um, it, the, the region is severely under-resourced in terms of homeless shelters, uh, direct services, healthcare services for queer and trans people, right? So that's, this is another dynamic to that. Um, we think about the U.S. South and we have to think about um, how Charlotte, North Carolina is the second largest banking city um, in the United States right after New York City, right? So thinking about uh, major bank headquarters, um, thinking about major corporations, concentration of capital, um, and how that capital and how these corporations um, and banks are protected. Um, we think about a, um, you know, when we think about the US South, we have to think about the crumbling infrastructure um, that exists in many um, parts of the South, um, particularly in the Deep South. Um, and, and, and this infrastructure is largely due to, of course, you know, corporate greed and government corruption, um, but to also the environmental destruction that's being caused by um, this capitalist crisis, right? So we think about uh, New Orleans, we think about Louisiana as a whole, we think about Mississippi, we think about the Gulf, uh, we think about uh, what happened when Katrina hit um, and thousands and thousands of people were displaced um, and left to die, primarily black folks, um, because the government was not interested um, in, in protecting people, right? And making sure that people got out of that safe um, and that they would be able to return home. Um, and then of course we have to think about uh, sort of the ongoing occupation of um, of Mexico, uh, we think about the Southwest, we think about New Mexico, Arizona, California, Texas, um, as a part of the Southwest and the continual occupation um, of those indigenous lands, um, and about the border towns that have been constructed, right, of, around these fake borders, um, these borders that uh, were created by um, imperialist wars um, that are now causing thousands of thousands of people to flee their country, um, to come to the US um, in, in search of um, less violence and, and more jobs when, you know, sort of the reality is that uh, US foreign policy is pushing people out, right? And so these are all of the wonderful things um, that we sort of have to think about in contextualizing what we mean when we talk about the US South um, and why it's so important that we look to the South uh, when we're talking about um, building for revolutionary socialism because there are so many um, different Um, so many different intersecting struggles um, that are really magnified there, right, um, that folks are taking up. Um, and so now I'm going to sort of zoom in a little bit and get a little bit more specific and talk about um, this recent um, um, disastrous bill that was passed in North Carolina. Uh, raise your hand if you've heard of House Bill 2. All right. Now, throw out some words about what ha House Bill 2 is. Anti-trans bathroom bill. Anti-trans bathroom bill. Anyone else? No wrong answer. Unless it's very wrong, but no wrong answer. The legalization of uh, like anti-discrimination anti policies to lower the state level. Okay, yes. Anyone else? Anything you read on Twitter, Facebook timeline, Instagram even, Snapchat? Yeah. It's Scott. spreading like to Mississippi and, and states all over the country and it seems like the, uh, like the mayor of, or the governor of North Carolina says things like, it's just a plain common sense thing that we should, I don't want certain people in a certain bathroom. It's just, yeah, that's what you hear. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. It's based off of fears of communications about transgender people and perpetuating lies about people who feel differently than them. Yeah. Anyone else? Cool. So it seems for the most part we're all on the same page in, in sort of having an understanding of what this bill is. Um, so what I'm going to do is 
um, I'm going to read, and I have copies of this up here, but I'm going to read the statement from the Black Lives Matter Queer and Trans People of Color Coalition um, that organized um, the sort of very first uh, response and fight back um, against HB2 when it was passed um, in North Carolina that will sort of offer um, more context um, as well as uh, give y'all an idea of the work that we've been up to um, in North Carolina and how we're framing this issue. Um, so on March 23rd, on the anniversary of the passing of Blake Brockington, a black trans teen from Charlotte, North Carolina, Governor Pat McCrory and the North Carolina General Assembly moved to attack working people and create dangerous conditions for women, LGBTQ people, black and brown people, and any workers who experience discrimination or who struggle to make ends meet. The General Assembly and Governor Pat McCrory chose to criminalize trans and gender nonconforming children and youth and to scapegoat transgender women and other trans people for rape by passing North Carolina HB2. House Bill 2 bars city and county governments from raising their municipal minimum wage, um, so minimum, uh, minimum wage uh, standards for contract workers, as well as prohibits anti-discrimination policies that account for gender identity, expression, and sexual orientation. Lawmakers were only given five minutes to review the bill and passed it within a 12-hour period without a single trans person of color being allowed to speak. This bill reinforces the school to prison pipeline that trans and gender nonconforming students of color already face by making their choice of to toilets grounds for suspension or arrest. This bill rolls back decades of hard won progress and will harm our whole state. It undermines municipal democratic control, advancements in anti discrimination policy, and further prohibits wage increases. This is a direct assault on working families and particularly working women of color who are, who are most likely to be paid poverty wages. LGBTQ folks of color are workers and we are worth more. This bill uses trans panic and the scapegoating of trans women to derail real conversations about safety and consent. Trans and queer people are survivors of sexual assault too. Our safety matters and we don't make our community safer by threatening others with the brute force of the murderous police or incarceration. If our state is truly concerned for survivors of sexual assault, it will make comprehensive consent and sex education mandatory. This law does nothing to prevent indecent exposure and sexual assault, which are already illegal, but instead prevents local governments from protecting the safety and livelihoods of queer and trans people. We honor and fight for Blake by affirming that our lives matter. Anti-transgender bias and legislation and persistent structural racism directly impact the devastating rates of suicidality, unemployment, physical and sexual violence, poverty, incarceration, and homelessness experienced by transgender people of color. Trans and queer people of color demand a living wage and freedom from criminalization and discrimination in the workplace and in the bathroom. Tonight, we are calling for a special session of the people outside of the governor's mansion for Blake Brockington, for Angel Alicia Walker, for all black and brown trans and queer people in North Carolina who have been murdered, disappeared, or incarcerated. It is our duty to speak. It is our duty to demand freedom, to demand a living wage, to demand education, to demand comprehensive health care that is accessible and free of charge. Um, so that's the statement, um, and folks, feel free to take a copy of that when you um, leave. And there's also um, a solidarity statement from the Workers' World Party presidential campaign um, that talks more about the bill. Um, and so I wanted to share that um, to sort of get us thinking about, um, get us talking about more components of HB2, right? Um, and look at HB2 as a very classic um, divide and conquer bill. Um, because the, the bill, uh, the very first provision um, is about trans people being legally required to use the bathroom that matches with our biological sex, right? So the sex that's on our birth certificate. Um, but provisions two and three um, are about workers um, who are also trans people, who are also LGBTQ people. Um, there's a provision in there, um, as mentioned in this statement, um, that prevents local municipalities from raising minimum wage standards for their contract workers. And then the third provision um, basically strips away really hard earned um, rights, workers' rights that we've fought for for many decades, right? Um, so now in North Carolina, if you experience discrimination on the job, if your employer 
um, treats you um, very badly, right, um, and is racist or sexist or homophobic or transphobic, um, you actually would have to file a federal complaint. You cannot bring a complaint against your employer on the state level, which poses a major barrier, right? Um, and so these are sort of the basic protections that um, the state uh, is trying to take away um, and sort of thinking it, looking at it um, from a sort of bigger picture, um, we have to look at um, the ways that the state is trying to um, take away local control um, and really trying to consolidate power um, in order to um, really uh, legitimize this panic, this trans panic, legitimize these fears and pit workers against each other, right? Um, and so um, I'll offer a little bit of a, a sort of timeline and some background, um, some additional background. Um, so I can like also go way back. But so for the past, like in, in North Carolina, for uh, the past several years now, we've seen uh, really regressive policies and actions come out of the General Assembly. Um, there was a dramatic sort of uh, reactionary takeover um, of, the, of the state level government that had been pushing um, a lot of really bad legislation through. So uh, they didn't you know, vote to pass uh, Medicaid expansion. Uh, recently, um, they voted to take away significant unemployment benefits. Earlier this year, they passed House Bill 318, uh, which was a, a very anti-immigrant um, piece of legislation uh, that essentially uh, prevents, again, local municipalities from being these sanctuary cities uh, where undocumented workers would have uh, minimal and, and sort of basic rights and protections in the workplace, uh, such as being able to file complaints against their employers regardless of status. Um, and so this is just sort of a pattern of really heightening attacks um, on working class and oppressed people um, as we see um, uh, queer and trans folks of color, as we see the Black Lives Matter movement really take off. Uh, these attacks, these reactionary attacks are also intensifying. Um, and so in terms of the HB2 timeline, um, so Charlotte, North Carolina passed an anti-discrimination ordinance that specifically outlined um, protections for trans people. Um, and it was a very long battle. The city council finally passed it. And then I think a few days later, Governor McCrory came out and said, we're going to do everything in our power to make sure that this doesn't happen, to prevent this from going into effect. Dude was like really excited. I've never seen him this excited before to do work. And oftentimes our politicians aren't excited about anything but ruining people's lives. So he was really excited. And then um, on March 23rd, the North Carolina General Assembly calls a special session. Um, and what that means is that they're not in regular session. Uh, they, all of the lawmakers are like at home. Um, and so they call everyone in for a special session, uh, which costs taxpayers like $25,000 um, in order to pass a piece of legislation that would prevent uh, this Charlotte ordinance from going into effect. Um, and so it passed in, in less than 12 hours. Uh, so it was introduced. Um, most lawmakers had not read it yet. They got five minutes to read it. It went into a committee, passed out of that committee, went into the House hearing, went into another committee, passed in that committee, went into the Senate, passed. It was like done. It was rapid fire. Um, I have never seen them work so fast. Um, and so the very next day on March 24th um, was a call to action that was put out by the Queer and Trans People of Color Coalition um, to um, occupy um, in front of the governor's mansion um, because he was the one who initiated this attack. He was the one who signed uh, the, the bill into law when it got to his desk. Um, despite demands for him not to. Um, and that night, um, over a thousand people from all across the state had come to Raleigh, North Carolina. So people were driving from like Charlotte, from Elizabeth City, Winston-Salem, from hours away um, to come um, protest this new law. Um, and um, towards the end of the evening, myself and four other organizers um, uh, did uh, civil disobedience and had chained ourselves together in the middle of the road. Um, and that evening, we got arrested um, to, to bring attention to the gravity of this bill, right? 
um, and throughout the evening, throughout the action, held space for activists to talk about uh, what this really meant, right? Because it's not just about bathrooms, right? Um, and it's not just about uh, whether you know trans people are going to be able to use the toilets that we want to, um, because we know that the attacks on LGBTQ people have been longstanding um, before HB2 became law. Trans people were being harassed in the bathrooms. Trans people were being targeted in the workplace. Um, and so it was important for us to uplift that, right? Um, to, uh, to really build a united front against this law and against the more repressive laws that are going to happen after this one, right? Um, because the General Assembly for the past several years have seen that they're able to do these things and will continue to do these things. And so it was really important for us to come together and start thinking about building people's power and not thinking about how do we change these lawmakers' hearts and minds, right? Because we knew that that wasn't going to be possible. Uh, we knew that their interests were not in the well-being of LGBTQ people of color, was not in the interests of women, um, of working class people, of immigrants, right? And so what, what do we need to do um, to come together to, to really fight back? Um, and I think that that's the sentiment that we share across North Carolina and, and across the US South, right? Because um, we think about our, um, our, our governments that we know are hugely um, inefficient and ineffective and don't have the interests of working people in, in, in mind. Um, and so it wasn't worth it to us to try to talk to folks about, well, let's just go to our lawmakers and make a moral argument. You don't really have morals when you sort of build up this fake narrative about trans people being predators. There's, there's no morals or conscience there to be, to be wrestled with, right? And, and that's sort of the, the reality, the political reality and the climate that we have to put ourselves in to prepare for, for what the real battle is, right? Um, it, it's challenging the system that prioritizes profit over people, right? Um, and so following this action about, about a week later, there's this like, you know, during during this whole thing, there's like a media storm and everyone's talking about it. Um, it's blowing up on social media. Um, they made this like satirical video about, you know, come to North Carolina where we're really backwards and oppressive. I'm not sure if folks saw that. It was sort of funny, sort of hurt my feelings, but that's well, it's another workshop. Um, about a week later, Governor McCrory comes out and issues um, a, an executive order um, because he realizes that he had dug himself a very deep hole and people were upset with him. Um, and he was starting to, you know, these like corporations and businesses and musicians and concerts were threatening to like, um, you know, cancel. Um, and so he issues this executive order and he says, all right, we're going to protect LGBTQ employees of the state. And he's like, we fixed it, right? We put a Band-Aid on this. And everyone's like, what does that do for anyone, right? Um, and um, so he keeps digging this hole for himself. Um, and then about two weeks ago, the US Attorney General, Loretta Lynch, um, went, had a press conference and, and went on camera um, and talked about how North Carolina is getting sued, right? That they are um, launching a federal lawsuit against the state of North Carolina, that there's all of this money that's at state, stake for um, education funding um, in the state. Um, and, and this, is a uh, is momentous, right? Um, for 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 trans folks who don't hear about our plight talked about in this way, right? Um, but it's also really complicated. It's also really complicated in that what do we, you know, sort of make of um, of an attorney general of an administration that comes out to say that they are going to protect and defend trans people, yet at the same time have the highest rate of deportation um, in, in any administration. Um, what does that mean? Uh, what does that mean for an administration to come out and say that they are protecting trans people uh, when um, they are in support of the Zionist occupation of Palestine and will not take a different stance on that, right? So we had a lot of, you know, it, it, it was complicated um, because we want to, uplift this struggle, but at the same time also understand that um, if it's not a win for all of us, then it's not truly a win, right? Um, and then 
um, about a week ago, the Department of Education comes out with this guidance um, on how public schools need to accommodate trans students um, and the rights that transgender students have um, in, in school buildings, right? The right to use whatever restrooms um, they would like to. Um, and so this is sort of the context and the timeline for HB2. And there are a few other things that I wanted to flag and sort of backtrack on. Um, so over the past several weeks, what we've seen in North Carolina um, is these like corporations um, coming out like against HB2 um, and saying that they're like in solidarity with the LGBTQ community. Um, and that raises, for the folks on the ground, um, for working class, LGBTQ people of color, it raises a really red flag for us, right? In the same way that um, a statement from the uh, Attorney General raises a flag for us. Uh, when Dow, Dow Chemical, when US Airlines, when PayPal is saying that they're against HB2, yet have these tremendous worker abuses, have this tremendous track record of exploiting labor, um, of laying off all of their employees, of getting buyouts um, from other banks and corporations, yet lay off their employees, we have to question that, right? Um, that, that, again, it, it's one of those things where if not all of us are winning, then it's not really a win, right? Uh, we can't align ourselves with these corporations that um, are still, at the end of the day, very invested in profit um, and not people. They're not the real fighters here. They're not the real allies here. They're not the real warriors here, right? It's, it's the queer and trans youth on the ground who are really pushing back and reframing this narrative. Um, and so I think as someone who lives and organizes and fights in North Carolina, it's really important for me to share that. Um, because I think it's crucial um, for us to really illuminate the perspectives of the folks who are on the front lines at the center of it. Um, and so um, with that, um, I wanted us to sort of um, actually take a few moments um, with the folks around us, um, so if you're not near people, make your way to them, um, in small groups um, to start thinking about, um, start discussing some of these key questions. Um, and I will repeat the key questions for folks who have just joined us. Um, and those key questions are, um, what are the unique conditions and challenges facing the South? Why is fighting for socialism in the, in the South important? What are the intersecting struggles being taken up currently? And how are queer and trans people of color leading the fight back? And strategically can become really important for building our movement, right? Um, anyone else want to share anything? No? OK. That's fine. Yes, go ahead. Um, it was interesting in, in, in our group um, because because it was a fight back a demonstration uh, in North Carolina puts it on the agenda everywhere in the country and the legislation does too that the government's response but it's, it's on the agenda everywhere just because there was immediate resistance, then young people at every school are taking this up now. And, and take, if it had just gone quiet, fast, it would have, it, it actually could have pushed things backward. But because it was like immediate resistance, it's opened it up all over the country. And in a lot of schools, students will make their own, they'll deal with this. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's the question that's out. Yeah, for sure. Monica. Um, I don't know whether you raised this at the beginning of your remarks um, about the uniqueness of North Carolina. When you said what are the unique conditions, mm -hmm. because as I was sharing with the group, you know, coming up to the South, you know, um, of course, there's the, the, the deep legacy of, of 
like slavery and, and Jim Crow and, and so forth, and of course helped give birth to the Civil Rights Movement, um, which didn't really come to the North. Uh, it was really mainly concentrated in, in the South. But what that has done, you know, notwithstanding all the, you know, the blood, sweat, and tears, you know, uh, of that move that came out of that movement, um, was a sense of of, of of changing social social conditions and behaviors, I think, um, and you know, being more conscious of of you know, black and white relations. It really did have that impact. Um, notwithstanding the North, which is, you know, different form of, you know, um, relations in terms of racism and, and so forth. So, and I think because North Carolina, um, putting aside the rest of the South, you know, of course there's the racism, there's the low wages, there's, um, you know, the attacks on unions um, and so forth. But what makes North Carolina so unique is that it's now being, you know, become the, the Wall Street of the South, with Bank of America being the main headquarters there, with Duke Energy, the insurance companies, you know, um, largely concentrated, or at least the largest one. More, more powerful in North Carolina. So in a lot of ways, North Carolina is a testing ground for a lot of these, for what happened um, with this bill. You know, if they can get away with it in North Carolina with no struggle, what, you know, where else can we get away with it? <laughs> because, you know, with the deepening global economic crisis, you know, that's um, just going to get worse. Um, they, the ruling class is going to need to divide and conquer our working class even more so. And this is one way they're trying to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think because there is this consciousness within North Carolina because of the civil rights movement, um, especially amongst you know many of the black population or large sectors of the black population, that if they can do this to our trans sisters and brothers, Okay, that's, but they're not going to stop there. You know, they they because they want to already they they're already eroding the civil rights legislation from '65 and '64. They're eroding it, and this is all part of that process. And that's why I think the, the issue of inter, intersecting the struggles is so important. And I had raised the the role of our Durham Workers World Party branch there that. Lone, who's one of the leaders of our branch there. Um, there's a history, there's there's a understanding there that it's important to link these struggles, uh, especially against the struggle against racism and white and white supremacy. Whether that's a Duke with you know the Duke the Cross case or whatever, you know, whatever issues um, that the struggle against racism and white supremacy is central to all of them in terms of LGBTQ, women, workers' struggles, immigrant struggles, and so forth. So um, I, I just think we need to pay a lot more attention to what's going on in North Carolina and its impact on the rest of the um, struggles around the country. But this is a testing ground. They, they try to get away with it in Georgia, mm -hmm. but they had to rescind that. Mm -hmm. They had to rescind that same legislation mm -hmm. when there was a when there was a um, when a number of forces threatened to boycott Georgia. And I think there's still discussion around North Carolina. I know the NBA All Star Game is supposed to be there next year, and. They may, hopefully, but, you know, they're talking about uh, taking out the All-Star game from Charlotte, which would be a big deal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's a big deal. So um, thank you.
everyone for engaging in this conversation. I, I think that it's always sort of a helpful reminder for us to think about, like Monica and others were saying, um, that that the, the South is really uh, the testing grounds for a lot of these really uh, reactionary attacks on, on, on workers and oppressed people, right? Um, and, and, you know, they say, as goes the South, right, so, so goes the rest of the country. Um, and that goes in both directions, right? Uh, when we win in North Carolina, when we win in the South, it has major implications for what's possible elsewhere. And when we lose, the clock is turned back everywhere. Right, because of this deep legacy of, of, of slavery and Jim Crow in the South. Um, and so um, there were sort of some other things that I wanted to speak to, because I know um, at the beginning I had sort of framed the South and had listed all of the horrible and, and, and terrifying sort of history and, and, and ongoing um, political reality of the South, but also wanted to you know, speak to and uplift the, the legacy of struggle in the South that is very rich um, and, and significant and important. And, and I want to start off with that by saying that uh, we really have to challenge ourselves in our movement spaces with each other around this idea of like having to save the South, right? The South doesn't need to be saved, right? Um, and I think that's a really crucial crucial lesson, right? When we think about how do we um, really center the leadership of those who are most oppressed and most impacted, we don't do that by assuming that uh, someone or a community needs our help, right? They need our solidarity, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. If anything, the South needs solidarity from the rest of the country, um, from, from, from revolutionaries elsewhere who believe that those who are living in these conditions can, can fight our ways, our way out of it, right? Um, and there was a really great piece uh, written by um, Q recently about, um, you know, queer and trans people of color being the vanguard of our movement. And I, I cannot stress how absolutely true that is, right? Um, especially when we think about the high rates of of, of murder of black trans women, when we think about the high rates of youth homelessness, uh, when we think about the high rates of displacement, right? Um, that queer and trans people of color are at the intersections of so many different oppressions, right? That are that are made, you know, that that are, are needed and necessary under our current economic system, right? Under capitalism. Like we there there needs to be homeless young people, right? There needs to be unemployed LGBTQ youth. These murders need to happen, right? Um, and it, it's really unfortunate, but that's just how the system operates, um, especially when in a state like North Carolina that slashes unemployment benefits, that makes um, you know um, that that makes it incredibly difficult for you to get a job, uh, that underpays, has low wages, doesn't allow you to unionize. Um, there's going to be a surplus of people who have nowhere to go, right? In in their communities, um, in in the workplace, don't have those options, um, and that's just how capitalism functions, right? And that's the reality there. Um, and queer and trans people of color have a really intimate knowledge of that um, and are at the front lines of ensuring that when a bill like HB2 happens, we're talking about the attacks on trans people, we're talking about bathrooms, but we're also talking about the larger attacks on working people. Um, and, and if anything, um, I think that queer and trans people of color throughout history from Stonewall, from the Compton Cafeteria riots, have always made the effort to unite workers and oppressed people, right? To say that we have one struggle and that's against the ruling class, right? That is against a shared oppressor. That is against a shared enemy. Um, and um, I think in the South, there's a huge emphasis on, on building unity and collective struggle because like Monica mentioned in, in the small group discussion when I was eavesdropping, it, it, North Carolina and the South isn't like Chicago or New York City or Los Angeles, right? It's, it's a sort of different 
context. Um, uh, the, um, the, the people that we have um, access to, the resources that we have access to, it looks different. It's much more limited, right? And so it's important for us that when something happens, we have, a, we have formed a united front um, because an attack on, on LGBTQ people is an attack on all of us. An attack on black communities is, is an attack on all of us. Um, and, and in the South, I think we're continually charged with um, centering the legacy of racism and white supremacy. Um, and um, as, especially as the Black Lives Matter movement grows, we're called to um, center that experience and center that struggle, right? Um, knowing that um, the at, sort of at the at the core of it, right? Even and and in, in in organizing spaces with other queer and trans people of color, um, our queer and trans um, comrades who are black will talk to the experience of being harassed on the workplace or in or in the bathroom, like regardless, right? Because black folks are deeply criminalized and targeted and policed, regardless, right? Um, and so we're we're charged with that. Um, especially knowing that in the South, when we organize, we organize in a very long legacy of, of, of the black struggle, right? And, and, and of, the, of, of freedom fighters um, who, who have brought us into a very certain kind of organizing tradition, right? In the South, we sing a lot. <laughs> Um, and we, we share cultural space a lot um, because we sort of recognize that one of the, when you can't bring people together um, by, you know, having high level theoretical conversations, you can always bring people together uh, by breaking bread or singing a song together. Um, and so I think that those are really inspiring and beautiful and amazing aspects of, of, of fighting um, in the U.S. South and fighting for socialism in the U.S. South. And I think now we're at a time where queer and trans folks of color, young people, um, when coming into these struggles, have a distinctive anti-racist and anti-capitalist analysis, whether or not folks call themselves socialists or not. The sort of common ground is that we understand capitalism to be a system of exploitation, and that's never going to change. And we can't reform it, right? We can't have democracy under capitalism. We can't have freedom of movement under capitalism. We can't have, you know, basic things like even healthcare or or, or food co-ops under capitalism. Those things are are not possible, right? Um, and so when I think about fighting for, for socialism in the U.S. South, um, I think about all of the ways that that's being framed um, in, in people's experiences, right? Um, the Queer and Trans People of Color Coalition is, is demanding health care for LGBTQ people, is demanding a living wage, is demanding housing, um, is demanding affordable education or free higher education. And those things are only possible under socialism. Right? We know that, that when workers and oppressed people are able um, to plan our economy, that we get our basic needs met. Right, And what young people, what Korean trans youth of color are demanding right now are very basic needs that have been completely stripped away because of this deepening capitalist crisis. Right? Um, it, it's sometimes very ridiculous to me when I sit back and think about, um, you know, people talk a lot about, like, young people and millennials. And I'm like, well, millennials are really just asking for a job and a place to live, right? That's sort of the bottom line. Um, and we've reached the point where we, we know that the only way that that's possible is, is for workers and owners to have ownership of our labor and of our communities. Um, and so with that said, I wanted to just share a little more information about the Workers' World Party um, election campaign um, that you can learn more about at workers.org. Um, and I think one thing um, that's really important for us to sort of come out and say at the forefront is that our, our, our campaign um, is about struggle. It's about organizing. It's about movement. It's about building the movement for revolutionary socialism um, that, in fact, we don't think we're going to win. Uh, we most likely will not win, although Monica is great, and I would love for her to be my president. But I'm much more grateful that she's my comrade. Um, and, and Lamont Lilly is also great. 
would be an awesome vice president, but we're not going to win, right? Because the sort of uh, ruling class elections is is just sort of a, a puppeteering game, right? Uh, we have two ridiculously like sort of caricatures um, who are likely going to be on the ballot in the fall, um, and regardless of what. Um, who wins, the struggle on the ground must continue, right? And so we're taking this opportunity as more and more people are talking about the, the, the elections, as more and more people are sort of grappling uh, with the question of what is next, right? Because we're faced with so many crises, right? We're faced with an economic crisis. We're faced with um, a, a pending recession. We're faced with um, terrifying police brutality. Uh, we're faced with massive layoffs. Um, people are, are searching for a place to go. Um, and I think for our campaign, um, what, what we know the way to go is, is through struggle and struggle for revolutionary socialism. There is no way out of this terrible mess um, of capitalism um, but to fight and to organize. Um, and I think that is the one thing that, that we owe to ourselves and to our communities um, because um, you know, even even the most progressive of candidates at the end of the day um, are in service of capitalism um, and not in service of workers and the oppressed. So with that, thank you so much um, for participating in this discussion today.